So it's an absolute privilege to be here today. My name's Rachel McKenzie, and I'm part of a post-aborted ministry called Rachel's Vineyard. I feel like... Thanks. I need to make a disclaimer here. Um, I didn't start Rachel's Vineyard, and the name is just a coincidence. Or maybe it's a god incidence. My older sister was meant to be called Rachel, and my mum happened to step back and let my dad have the favourite name for the eldest one. So when I was born, she said, this one's going to be called Rachel. And God's in that small detail. Because Rachel originates from the book of Jeremiah, the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord, in Ramah is heard the sound of moaning, of bitter weeping. Rachel mourns her children. She refuses to be consoled because her children are no more. And Rachel mourns her children in the Bible. She grieves the loss of the children that were so cruelly killed, innocent and without a voice. The only voice that could be heard was the screaming of their mother. Today, we are mourning. We are no mourning nine million children lost in the UK since the Abortion Act 50 years ago. I haven't got time to mention every single child, because it's not about you, but I can't get my head around the number, nine million. But I'd like to talk to you today about two. Two babies that were killed by abortion, killed by their mother. A mother that thought, my body, my choice. Well, it's legal, it's gotta be okay. Who thought pregnancy crisis meant the only solution would be abortion. Their mother didn't think hard and long about it. She was doing it through fear, false evidence appearing real. She can't cope, she's too young, she's still at school. And pride, what will people think of me? These two children were boys and they were brothers and they were about four years apart. And these boys have got names, like every child rightly has a name, like their mother has a name. Their names are Paul Peter and Jude John. And their mother's name is Rachel. I am their mother. Rachel in the Bible cannot be consoled. We cannot go or bypass the grief journey. Grief cannot be ignored. But some of us, like myself, will go to great lengths on that journey of pain to just hop out stay in denial, be angry. That first stage of grief, denial. There's five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, until you get to acceptance. And you bounce through these different stages, and they could be in any order. But once you get to acceptance, that's where the peace is found. Acceptance allows us to move forward. We can still be sad, and that's okay. But once we've reached that, ple that place, that journey, to, through grief, that's where the peace is. And a mother grieving through the child they've lost through abortion has to go through that same process. But on top of that process, if the grief isn't hard enough, is the added pain, the torment, and the guilt that we were and I was the cause of killing my children. Our own childhood experiences impact who we are today. And my childhood was interesting to say the least. And I picked up a weapon of choice from a childhood. I picked it up and used it in traumatic situations. And it was an imaginary button. And I pressed it so I didn't have to feel. And I took that imaginary button of not feeling, or thinking I didn't feel, into my adulthood. I craved love. I craved to get married. But I didn't understand what love was. I didn't understand that every life deserves love, including my own. I believed you had to work for love. And I had to earn it. And my choice of men were never the best. And because of my lack of understanding for love, I confused love and promiscuous behaviour. And I kept repeating that same pattern again and again, thousands of times with hundreds of men. 
So it wasn't long, obviously, if that's the kind of life I was going to lead, that I was going to eventually become pregnant. And I became pregnant for the first time when I was about 17 or 18. I don't know the age because of that button that I used. I was frightened, scared, alone. Fear gripped me. And I immediately went into that first stage, denial. I just wanted it to go away, but it wasn't going to go away on its own. I would have been nearly 24 weeks of just hoping that I was going to miscarry. I know the, the only reason I know that is I know that we're panicking in the abortion facility, let's not call it a clinic, and they were panicking that I was reaching that line. I was never offered a choice. One choice is no choice. An uninformed choice is no choice. I was shown no scan, no one was telling me you can do this, and nobody was outside the abortion facility like there is today with the Good Council Network and 40 Days for Life. And I'm sure you've heard the propaganda that those outside who are actually very peaceful are not giving people choice. And they're the people that I wish had been there for me. Put your hand up if your car's ever broken down. If your car breaks down, I know that my husband can fix it. I know I can ring a friend, I can ring a mechanic, I can ring the recovery service. I know this because it's happened loads of times. When I was pregnant, it had never happened before. So how do I know how to get help if I don't know what I'm looking for? I'm a bit fed up and it frustrates me when I hear people say that the Good Council Network and 40 Days for Life need to stand somewhere else. It's exactly outside the abortion facilities these people need to be. You cannot force a woman to keep her baby, but you can force a woman to have an abortion. Let that sink in. You cannot force a woman to keep her baby. I have never heard a woman yet that decided to give their child life re regret it, ever. If a woman has thought long and hard about the decision of abortion, If a woman has thought long and hard about the decision of abortion, why is there so much regret? How can I hear so many tragic stories through Rachel's Vineyard and those who are very much traumatised and living with the guilt? So how much regret did I have when I had my first abortion? I'd love to stand here today and say to you, I felt nothing but regret, but all I felt was relief. I wouldn't allow myself to feel but soon after, I split up with my boyfriend and I became very angry and very loud. And I'd shout at anybody who didn't share my views. Do I remind you of anyone? Yeah. I was in denial. And if you keep doing the same thing, the same outcome is going to happen. So my promiscuous behaviour carried on. So four years later, there I was again, pregnant. And it's a miracle I wasn't pregnant in between but I was using the morning after pill as if it was just a headache tablet. So goodness knows how many children were lost that way. But the second abortion was different. This time I was awake, awake. So no media, no B-pass, no Mary Stokes can tell me that abortion doesn't hurt. I was awake. And I was awake and I watched the abortionist count my baby's body parts. And I know that's really hard to hear, but we need to hear that because we've got to stop dehumanising the unborn like they try to. And I watched them, but I went straight back into denial. And I lived in that denial for years. And the irony of my abortionist counting the body parts was to make sure that I lived. How crazy is that? Save the mother but not the child. We saved both. I was afraid, and in that denial, 
The next stage is anger. The anger in my head was explosive. The violence would frighten me that was going on in my head after the second abortion. And I was even full of fear that my dark secret was going to come out. It was going to come out to my mom, to you, and worst of all, to myself. But in 2000, I had no choice for the secret to come out because I was being blackmailed. And I had to tell my mum, after I signed my house over everything, so my mum wouldn't know about the abortion, I still was being blackmailed, and I had to tell my mother. And, you know, she showed me nothing but love. And she said, you need God, and you need Rachel's Vineyard in your life. And I told her and God and Rachel's Vineyard where they could go. Because this denial, it goes so deep. But in 2008, I had a huge conversion, and I ended up in front of a priest within a couple of days and thanks to my mother's prayers and I told the priest about the two abortions that I'd had and he said I had to join all the life groups. It took 10 years to get there but I did it and my mom was still nagging me, you know, you need to go to Rachel's Vineyard so I'll wait till God tells me. So I went to Medjugorje two weeks after converting and I bump into a priest from Ireland and there was only two priests in the whole of Ireland that are part of Rachel's Vineyard and I bump into one in Medjugorje. I knew I had to go. So at Rachel's Vineyard a year later, I went to Cork, quite nervous, everybody is, and there I met, I met Jesus and I met the mercy and love of God. And the team, the team's made up of post-abortive women and men like myself. There's always a trained counsellor at a very high level and a priest. And you don't have to be Catholic to come at all. But being Christian helps, but again, you don't have to be that either. And it's a safe environment to grieve, to work through that grief. Just as a cancer patient doesn't want to be given a paracetamol for the cancer, I needed to recognise what was eating away at me. I was... I was grieving the children that I thought could have been. And this came out in Rachel's vineyard. And all the women, they'd gone on to have children. And because of my second abortion where I was awake, and it was quite a botched abortion, I can't have children. And I thought, that's no more than you deserve. And it was then, they were crying. And I'd still got that button that I used to switch. And I said, I feel such a fake. You're all in all in this terrible turmoil, and I can't cry, and I'm not a mother, and all of you have gone on to have children. And the priest turned round and he said, it's not that you could have been a mother, Rachel. You are a mother. And that just blew my head off. And I swapped God's heart and mercy, and I gave him that button, and I started feeling. I always wanted to start a Rachel's Vineyard, but I know that ego can get in the way, so I waited for the miracle of Rachel's Vineyard asking me, and it happened. So now I facilitate a Rachel's Vineyard in the Midlands. If any of you are suffering, or you know somebody that is suffering, please lead them to the website. There is many Rachel's Vineyards around the country, and they're all run the same way. And you are not alone. Your life you deserve to have it back because your life deserves love. And my passion and my first love is helping these women and men who have suffered through the trauma of abortion. But one of our hand-picked priests that we use said, wouldn't it be great the day that we don't have to have Rachel's Vineyard because abortion is eradicated from this world? I'm so glad you clapped because here comes your job. <laughs> so to do this, I can't just do Rachel's Vineyard. To do this, we've got to pick up, all of us, all the weapons, all the weapons to fight this battle. And it's not about always being comfortable. If you've got the gift of prayer, amazing. We need it, this battle's spiritual. But ask yourself, are we doing enough? And the answer will be no. If you write to MPs, it's brilliant, but you should also be doing the praying. We need to pick up every single one. Being here today is amazing, but we need to support all the organisations. 
Isabel, who runs 40 Days for Life in Birmingham, will hate me saying this, but she gave me the mic. She spent over four hours outside the abortion facility because other people were ill. We didn't have enough backup people. And she didn't do it once, she did it many, many times over the last campaign. We all need to do our part. We need more volunteers. More donations are needed for events like this, for helping the Good Council Network and for supporting Rachel's Vineyard. Remember the book of James clearly states that faith without good work and deeds is quite dead. We cannot be silent in the workplace or in our churches. If we say we are Christian, but you know, it's okay in some areas, you know, the 1%, it's okay for abortion there. Well, that's like saying you're vegan as you're chomping away on chicken. You can't do both. If you're Christian, you have to be part of this battle. God's mercy is abundant and it's so beautiful for me. He didn't show me all the terrors that I caused my children straight away. To the point that when I was outside the 40 days vigil, the last one, it was there that I had a flashback and realised that's where I had an abortion 25 years earlier. I kill my children and I cannot make excuses or turn back the time. But I can be used, like Moses, like David, like Paul, who killed in their lifetime before recognising all life deserves love. We need to prevent other Rachels killing their children and we can only do this through love. My boys, Jude and Paul, deserve love. My life deserves love. And as for Mary Stokes and B-Pass and the so-called sister supporter pro-choice groups, you haven't got to like them. You're not called to like them. You're called to love them because every life deserves love. God bless.